Welcome to Savvy Sab's podcast. I'm your host, Sabrina Salvati. My special guest tonight is Marcel Dixon. He is running against Representative Jim Clyburn for Congress. Welcome back, Marcel. Sabrina, thank you for having me back. So you actually made a big announcement. I want to share this with everyone. I saw your tweet here or your post. I don't know what we're calling it these days since it's no longer Twitter. But you said, as I have always said, it is policy always, party never. My original purpose for running with the Democratic Party was to hold them accountable from within. Seeing how they get 85 to 90 percent of the black vote but have utterly failed and betrayed us. I believe I made that message clear. This year, I will be running under the United Citizens Party. As we know, third parties tend to get very little traction or attention, but the United Citizens Party has been welcoming towards me and my platform. I'm excited to be joining them this year. So Marcel, I was very happy to hear your announcement. <laughs> that was very I said, yes, <laughs> another one, but explain to people, uh, why did you decide to, you know, ultimately in the end, because I know you've run as a Democrat before, why did you decide ultimately this time around to pursue running as a third party candidate? Well, the first reason is because of fearness. I believe I wasn't from the last, my experience running with the South Carolina Democratic Party, I realized I was never going to get a fair shot with them. Now, Defeating someone like James Clyburn, who is not just any Democrat, but is one of the most powerful Democrats in the National Democratic Party, one of the most powerful politicians in America, that's an uphill battle. I understand that. But last time I ran, there will be opportunities for advertisement that will not be shared with me and the other candidate who is running against James Clyburn. For example, during one of the conventions, there were brochures and you open the brochure, it looked like James Clyburn might as well said it was the James Clyburn magazine. The other candidate informed me that he asked to be featured in that brochure, and he was told by the South Carolina Democratic Party that they would get back to him, and of course, they never did. Okay? The chairman, the then chairman of the South Carolina Democratic Party, he would attend meetings with posters pretty much endorsing James Clyburn's platform. Now, I paid my party dues, as did the other candidate. As a chairman, he is supposed to be neutral in the race. And yet he would show up pretty much with James Clyburn's posters behind him. And then when James Clyburn had his famous, I should say infamous fish fry, he called James Clyburn his daddy. Kind of weird, but that's exactly what happened. So that was the one reason. James Clyburn's daughter is the director of the political party. Now, remember when Stacey Abrams ran for governor of Georgia and Brian Kemp was the secretary of state? And remember, you could hear the Democrats scream 24-7 about fairness. That's unethical. Yet they had nothing to say about James Clyburn's daughter being the director of political affairs of the party for the South Carolina Democratic Party when James Clyburn is a candidate running for election. So it was a double standard. It was a lot of hypocrisy. The second reason is how dogmatic they were in that party. A lot of people on the left, and I don't like to use the terms left and right because it really is a unity party, but a lot of people on the left like to talk about people on the right are very dogmatic. If you don't agree with them, they will they'll, you know, get out of here. They, they mark you as public enemy number one. That exists is more on the left, okay? If you disagree with them to any extent, you are seen as a threat to the party while they brag about being a big umbrella. The Republicans don't brag about being a big umbrella. They kind of admit that, yeah, we're dogmatic. If you don't think like us, we want you out of here. The Democrats say they are a big umbrella and they're welcoming the people of different ideologies. That I found to be a lie. And my main ideology was telling them they have an obligation to their black voter base, the freemen, the black Americans who are descendants of the emancipated. 
Well said. I mean, we've been trying to tell people this for for quite some time. I think Marianne saw this as well uh, with the way that they treated her. RFK also saw this. That's why he's running as a as an independent. It's a mess. Uh, they basically just pick who they want in those positions. And a lot of these people have already bought their way in or they've rubbed elbows with the right people. Uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, Jim Clyburn is probably really close to Jamie Harrison, right? Oh, yes. Jamie Harrison attended James Clyburn's. I forgot the name of the James Clyburn has a program he does every year. It's called the Clyburn Associates. Jamie Harris is alumni of that program. And of course, when Jamie Harrison ran against Lizzie Graham and had me escorted out of his little rally by the police because I asked him what was he going to do for the black American voters while he was having his rally in Orangeburg, South Carolina, one of the poorest counties in America that's 70% black, while his platform had things for the LGBTQ. I'm not against things we've done for the group, but what about the black American voters he had me ask about? James Clyburn was right there giving him his endorsement. They're extremely close. I was, that's why how Jamie Harrison ended up getting this nice job that he has. Uh huh. There, there was another woman too. I'm not sure if she's if she was a part of FBA, but she actually um, was asking Jamie Harrison that uh, same question. She was like, "What about us? What are you going to do?" And he walked off the stage. That woman, FBA, refers to just the lineage of those who are descendants of the emancipated, those who were emancipated from American slavery. But I do know those two, those two ladies, and they're reparationists. I will call them that. They're reparationists just like me. And he gets very nasty, very vindictive when he is confronted about the neglect of black voters. And yet he, referring to Jamie Harrison, he is a man who uses the story of his grandparents who grew up in dire poverty they're in Orangeburg, South Carolina. He talks about the neglect they experience while he perpetuates that same neglect. Yes, he does. He also takes a lot of money from Big Pharma, too, which I think oh, yeah. is a big, you know, that can really turn voters off of Jim Clyburn, especially those that are older voters and they have to like ration their insulin. I know many people in that situation that can turn some of those people off if they just know what he's what he's saying versus what he's doing. If you're taking all that money from Big Pharma, then obviously, of course, you're going to push back against any type of expansion of Medicare, et cetera, any type of. And I, I think if more people knew where the money was coming from, if they knew who he was in bed with in reference to these lobbyists, and then we can bring in Israel into this conversation as well, because Jim Clyburn, again, he's just another one of the representatives that is a part of the Black Caucus, uh, I think still a part of the progress Progressive Caucus in the House, but he's also uh, has an alliance uh, with I Israel. We're seeing more of these politicians stand up for Israel, uh, another country, but they won't stand up for people in this country. And more Americans, I think, need to start pushing back on that. I can tell you in James Clyburn's district, the voter turnout is somewhere at like 12 to 15 percent. So very few, the vast majority of people don't even come out to vote at all because they see it's either James Clyburn historically speaking, or it's another choice that they're not too enthused about. So it's usually a bad choice or an even worse choice if you can be even worse than James Clyburn, which you cannot. So most people just tend to stay home. The few people that come out to vote for him, a lot of people like to say, well, why do the black people there keep voting for him? It's not a lot of the black people voting for him. It's a lot of the white liberals who come out to vote for James Clyburn. On the matter of Israel, the same ones who, and you know, my attitude is, the needs of Black Americans, freemen, will not be pushed to the back burner for any other issue like they have historically been done. We're always told, well, we got to address the issue in Ukraine first. Or oh, the issue with the Palestinians, the issue has to be addressed right now. Or oh, the issue with the people coming to the country illegally, that's the most important issue. You guys have to wait. I We're not tolerating that. However, as you saw what happened in Charleston when so, so, well, so Joe Crow Biden was in the church and the there were some protesters there who were simply saying that the genocide in Palestine has to stop. People started chanting four more years. Those are the type of people who come out to vote for James Clyburn. The one who knows that it's James Clyburn's district, okay, has the worst water quality in America, highest eviction rate in America is the sixth 
poorest district in the United States of America, which has 435 districts total. The same ones, the small contingency that comes out to vote for them are the same ones who are fine with seeing a genocide and having no issues against it. And Sappy, let me tell you why. James Baldwin said, if they come for you in the morning, they'll be coming for me that night. What they do to black Americans and are done to us historically and are still doing to us, they're going to eventually do to everyone. We have been victims of a genocide and we still are in many ways. So when people say they can't believe this country is sitting back supporting it, why can't you? This is the same country that enslaved, raped, burnt, deprived, terrorized, and excluded us from programs that were wealth building. And we have yet to get any compensation for that. And everyone goes about day after day as if it's okay. So why are we surprised people are going about day after day as if what's being done in Palestine and other areas is perfectly fine? This is a very good point, and this is something I've tried to get across to people, and we'll get to uh, your vision for a better America in just a second. But what you just said there about what this country has done, like what is hap- what they're ag- agreeing to, uh, basically in reference to the Palestinian people, how they've treated black Americans in this country, it'll eventually happen to you too. So yes. for those, especially those of you watching, like for example, poor white people, they'll come oh, yeah. for you too. They'll come for you too. So if you think about healthcare, for example, a lot of people may not realize this, but one of the reasons why we don't have healthcare for everybody in this country is because they didn't want black people to have it. It's a similar situation with social security if you're you're not aware. But what they didn't realize at that point in time is that by penalizing black people and saying, we're not gonna give everybody healthcare because we don't want black people to have it, that actually also hurt poor white people. And see, they didn't think about that at that point in time. So it'll happen to you too. I make the case to a lot of white South Carolinians who are vehemently against reparations. And I say to them, you are saying that the American government can do all of the horrors. I don't need to recount them because a lot of times they know all of the horrors and injustices they have done to black Americans. You are saying that the federal government can do all of that and never be held accountable accountable for those atrocities. I said, do you realize the message you are sending to them about what they can do to you? I said, because trust me, I said, I hear more white conservatives now complaining about the government being tyrannical, about the government not being, um, having integrity, about their vote not counting. And I am seeing at these protests about the genocide in Palestine, where a lot of white people are really being treated the way that some police officers have mistreated black Americans. And they are saying that this incorrupt. They're saying that the economy is not working for them. They're saying that they're being left behind. And I say to them, who has been saying all of these things for centuries, and you told them to stop being victims, to pull themselves up by their bootless straps. What they do to us, they will do it to you because you have allowed them to do it to us. You defended them. Well said, Marcel. And I want to bring up this here. This is on your website, Marcel's Vision for a Better America, a better deal for Black America, better transportation, better education, a better plan for thriving communities. And I want to dive into uh, your plan for Black America. It talks about uh, reparations and you go into specifics here, which I've pointed out to people as well. America has paid and continues to pay reparations every single day. They paid to Japanese Americans forced into concentration camps. They just paid it to residents of Guam who were taken as prisoners of war during World War II. They paid it to victims of the Iranian hostage raid, and they paid it to American enslavers, but not to black Americans they enslaved. They are paying it now to Native American tribes, to people exposed to radiation, and even mostly to Jews who survived the Holocaust. I want to bring this up for example as well. I'm not sure if you saw what Governor Hochul actually just did in New York, where she actually just agreed to give uh, money towards Holocaust uh, victims as well. So this is recent. This is not reparations that was given by Germany, but this is continuing on today. But the moment we say that we should have that for American descendants with slavery, all of a sudden it's no, 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 no. It needs to be for everybody or 
I don't want my money, my tax dollars going to pay towards it. But I don't hear any of those people, you know, pushing back and having that same type of, you know, animosity towards Kathy Hochul, who just is giving more money towards those that were survivors of the Holocaust. And this is not to say that they shouldn't have it. But what it is to say is that where is that for us when we're talking about for over 400 years of slavery? We're talking about free labor that happened in this country. We're talking about, you know, generations of of black people that didn't have generational wealth to pass down to people, home ownership, land ownership. We're talking about Jim Crow. We're talking about the crime bill. We're talking about the war on drugs, redlining. It continues to go on and on and on. And so to me, I just want you to explain to people when people say they don't want their tax dollars to pay to that, what is you think the best response for that? Well, I say they just made the case for reparations. They're saying that yes, you are deserve reparations. We just don't want to pay it. So they acknowledge reparations are due. Now, as far as how to pay it, I will say to them, there's a precedent for reparations. It's being done. It's being done every single day for several Native American tribes. It's being done every single day for the downwinders. You know what, Sabi? A lot of people don't talk about the downwinders. The people who were exposed to radiation during America's era of nuclear testing, who live in the four corner states, they still get reparations every single day. And so do their children and grandchildren because supposedly they still have health ailments from the radiation poison. The, the, the downwind radiation poisoning. So it's being done every day and you don't have any issues with that. I also say that the federal government, and this is probably one of the most controversial things that I say, and yet I'm not going to stop saying it because I too perhaps used to believe this, but it's not true. And I'm not going to back down from seeing it because a lot of us have been taught wrong. The federal government does not rely on our tax dollars to generate a budget. They haven't relied on it for a during now and there century and almost going on two centuries. They do not. Now that's that what they do rely upon is our participation in the economy, but not necessarily our tax dollars. But I will also say to those people, because usually what I get to is, well, what about the Irish? What about this group? What about that group? Well, they deserve reparations too, then if something's been done wrong to them. But we are talking about the freedmen. So if you can agree and you have no issues with these other groups getting what are due to them, then why is it only an issue when it's due to the freedmen? Well said, Marcel. And on that same note, I want to get your opinion about this statement that was made from uh, Coleman Hughes. Uh, he was another one uh, that opposes uh, reparations. He actually spoke uh, to a committee about this. I think this actually happened in Congress. He was on uh, a black news channel with Mark Lamont Hill a while back, and he was explaining why he's opposed to reparations. I want you to hear what he says, and I want to get your take on this. Joining me now is Coleman Hughes. He's the host of Conversations with Coleman. It's a podcast that he hosts. Coleman, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, let's get started right away with this question of uh, opposing the idea of reparations. You, you talk about it as a moral uh, mistake as well as a political mistake. What's the moral mistake here? The moral mistake is that obviously when the victims of a historical crime are still alive, there is a moral obligation of the perpetrators to pay reparations. When we're talking about, so for, for instance, it would, it would be a morally necessary, in my opinion, as I said at, at the hearing, to pay reparations for Jim Crow to survivors of the Jim Crow system. Now, on the other hand, when you're talking about the, the median black American being around you know, 35 years old or so, born in the 80s, is there a moral obligation to take money from one group of people and give it to that person for a crime that happened 200 years ago, that's a very different situation and one in which you have to consider whether it's politically wise to do that, whether it actually serves the interests of the community that is suffering from many different problems in the present that need to be solved. To frame that solution as reparations, saying essentially blaming a group, a group of people that don't feel connected to the crime because it was so long ago, right? So that's what I mean by a moral and political mistake. 
Marcel, I would like for you to chime in with your take about what he said there. This is Coleman Hughes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but I'm familiar with him, unfortunately. But one, reparations is not something that's done based on morality. It's done based on legislative precedent. America is a nation that has done reparations many, many times. They even paid reparations to people who enslaved. Yeah. Black Americans, okay? They pay reparations to intern Japanese. Again, to several Native American tribes, the downwinders, the Iranian hostages, the people of Guam. And I'm not against any of those people getting what's due to them. Why is the only exception for the people who are descendants of the emancipated, freemen, okay? That's number one. Reparations is a legislative precedent. Uh, number two, I get really sick and tired of people saying, well, those were the people who were actually wrong, not their descendants. That is a lie. When the Japanese, the intern Japanese were paid reparation, I was four years old. It was in 1988. The wrong that was done to them were in the 1940s. Several of them had died by that time. You know what happened? When the Civil Liberties Act, that's the act that paid reparations to the inter Japanese. They made legislation for their descendants to receive reparations in the case that some of them had died because several of them, a lot of them had died by that time. And checks did not go out until 1992. And more of them had died. The Iranian hostages, the people who were actually taking hostages, several of them were dead by the time reparations were doled out. The Native Americans today who receive reparations to their respective tribes, they are definitely not the Native Americans who were alive in the 1700s and the 1800s. Their descendants are getting paid. I already discussed the downwinders whose children and grandchildren today are getting paid. The Holocaust survivors, America does not necessarily pay reparations to Holocaust survivors, but they've done special programs for them and their descendants. Again, why is it only an exception when it comes to Black Americans, the freemen? And you know what people always leave out, um, um, They always leave out that, yes, chattel slavery was one thing, but what about sharecropping? What about Jim Crow, redlining, the FHA, the FHA that targeted and destroyed black communities? Those things did not end until 1968. My great-grandmother, my dear Nana, died in 2015 at 101. I mourn her every day. She was raised by a man who was enslaved. I was 31 when she died. I lived most of my life with a woman who was raised by a man who was enslaved. So slavery was not a long time ago, and Jim Crow and redlining were damn near just yesterday. And well, I've challenged you, Coleman Hughes, to a debate if you really want to have it, brother. Coleman, Coleman Hughes, I would love to see you have this debate with Marcel yeah. Dixon. Because how do you feel about people, and a number of people have told me this before, how do you feel about people like Coleman who, from what I understand, is Afro-Latino? Yes. Or, or, how do you feel about people who are not freedmen, but they're put into the spotlight to speak on these issues, and they do so in such a way that is actually just going to hurt any type of, of movement that we try to build, but at the same time, they will defend Israel, which he is heavily doing, uh, basically su subscribing to Zionism, uh, working with someone like Barry Weiss. So what you can stand up and you can write these articles and you can defend the Israelis. But every time it comes to giving freedmen something in this country, you are the first one in line to say, here's why we can't do it. And we shouldn't focus on race. We should only focus on class. But it's OK for you to focus on identity when you're talking about the Israelis. And that's something I've noticed with people like him and a couple others, too, that are starting to make their, their mask is starting to fall off. But how do well, you feel? Well, about that? It's a betrayal because Coleman Hughes, who if people did not know his heritage, who I heard he's a Puerto Rican heritage, he would not be able 
to have a lot of the rights that he enjoys, if not for the fight and struggle of my ancestors, like my great grandmother. My great grandfather, Sabrina, is going to turn 100 this year. My great grand aunt, my dear aunt Rena, is going to turn 100 this year as well. If not for people like them, Coleman Hughes would not enjoy a lot of the rights and assets that he enjoys. So he benefits from the Black American struggle while at the same time condemning our continued fight for justice while he benefits from our continued fight for justice. That is number one. Number two, I dare Coleman Hughes to tell the Israelis, the Holocaust survivors, that they don't deserve a penny of reparations for the Holocaust and that they need to pay back to Germany, to Poland, to France, and the other European nations that have spent billions in reparations for them. Will Coleman Hughes ever say that? We all know he would not. So it's anti, I don't even want to call it racism. I don't even want to call it anti-blackness. This is anti-black American hatred that he indulges in because it feeds some of his base. And also, I want to talk to my fellow white Americans. First of all, there's a lot of white Americans who do support reparations. There are a lot of white Americans who are against reparations, not because of hate, but some of them have legitimate concern about things such as inflation and the debt. Those, they do exist. It is not because of hate. I've spoken to white Americans where I have that economic discussion with them. They say, you know what? That makes sense. There are white Americans out there who are absolute bigots. I'm not trying to reach them. But I do speak to some white Americans who say to me, my family came here the 1920s, the 1940s. We had nothing to do with slavery. So you are telling me that your family came here as immigrants, but you're telling a person who was a descendant of the people who were enslaved and toiled away and their labor and internet built this nation and were never given compensation by this nation, what well, we don't deserve, while well, you came to this nation after we pretty much built it up and contributed to its wealth and to its infrastructure and to the very survival of this nation. Because Abraham Lincoln said, if not for the black freedmen soldiers, America would have fallen. And you don't ever stop to think how wrong it is to tell Americans who are here already what they don't deserve and what they do deserve while you came and benefited from their struggle and their fight. Well, I tell you one thing, I would it, I would love to see that debate between you and Coleman who I would host it right here. Right <laughs> here. I would host it. He, wanted, he won't do it. <laughs> oh my God, because no, these things need to be said. And I, I get tired of seeing people who, and it's usually someone in the audience will tell me, Sabrina, that's not that person's full name. So I, I was, it was explained to me, his name is Coleman Cruz Hughes. For whatever reason, the Cruz is, is hidden. I, I think that's on purpose. Uh, yeah. But there are people that they basically, they prop up and you got to ask, why are they propped up? Right. Why would Barry Weiss prop up someone? Because he agrees with the Zionist views, right? So they prop them up. They have a black face. And so other people can point to them and say, see, this guy is black. He doesn't agree with reparations. Like this is all a, a game. May and I say something to that note? I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Even during the days of slavery, there were black people who fought on the side of their enslavers. So I don't care if you get 2 million black faces to say they're against reparations. I've had some people say that. Well, I know the older black gentleman, I know he say he's against reparations. Okay, then he can sign away his check and give it to me. There were people who were enslaved who were uh, against the ab abolition of slavery. There were people doing the days of Jim Crow and redlining who thought Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a troublemaker and just need to go and sit down somewhere. So trying to use a black face and use that to kind of give some uh, to 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 give to use that to to kind of give some validity to your stance against reparations, which is based on you just feeling like Black Americans are not do justice. That is just not right at all. How do you feel about this concept of you know? And I'm seeing this a lot lately, where people say you know don't focus on race, just focus on uh, class, or they they say it as identity politics, right? But class is also an identity, so. It seems like what they're really saying is just don't talk about race, period. <laughs> you know what's funny? You can't talk about class without talking about race. Here you go. So what's plan is that? You cannot talk about 
the, I, I hate this word, but the wealth, this terminology, but the wealth gap, you cannot talk about the wealth gap in America without talking about race. At the end of chattel slavery, you know, a lot of the white conservatives like to say, well, black people were harder working in the past and marriage rates were up. Okay. And guess how much of American wealth we owed at that time? 0.5%. So all of those, they say we just need to marry each other. I'm for black marriages. We do work hard and I believe in hard work. Okay. But we cannot out hard. We cannot hard work our way out of the hole that America did. What I say to people, if we went to the bottom of American society and that was because of our own personal failing, that that would be our own personal responsibility. But I tell white conservatives, you cannot preach to me personal responsibility while at the same time telling me the federal government has no responsibility to repair the centuries of damage they've done to us. If we were to the bottom because of our personal decisions, that would be different. We're to the bottom because of the decisions of the American government. And while the people today did not enforce slavery, the same entity, the American government, enforced it and did not protect our constitutional rights and allowed it. Well said, Marcel. What do you think? Um, Because I honestly, like I've seen you on other shows as well. I think that someone like you can actually beat Jim Clyburn, especially running outside the duopoly. Uh, what do you think it will take? I mean, obviously, I know that you'll need to raise a lot of money. We all know how electoral politics works. But I mean, like in reference to reaching maybe some of those voters that you said do not come out and support Jim Clyburn, what do you think it's going to take in reference to the ground game? It takes really reaching them in their homes. And this is a 97% rural district. I'm rural. We spend a lot of our times outside of our home making long commutes. So it's very hard to reach us. We don't have a central area where we all gather. So we're outside of our homes a lot. What I've been doing is spending a lot of time trying to get the word to them. I can't afford mass millers like James Clyburn can do. He can send a mass miller out every day and just flood them with lies about how great he's been for us. Because we all know that those are lies. I cannot compete with that, and I'm not trying to compete with that. However, what I can do is have volunteers that I have who have already sent out 34,000 texts or some of that has been phone calls. Some of that has been text messages. We've already sent out close to 9,000 flyers and we're sending out more and more every day. So yes, I definitely need money. I definitely need donations. And I definitely can defeat James Clyburn. That's why he will not have debates. Someone in his camp said to me, why would he debate you? He's not trying to help give you a platform. I said, it should not be about that. It should be about debate me to prove why he deserves their vote. Should he not want to legitimately give his constituents, the, the show them, give them a chance to see why he's the better choice? No, he's really just interested in allowing people to believe that he's been good for them, which most people don't believe, but he also does not want them to see that there are other opportunities. If I'm representing you and there's a better person out there who can do better than I, I want to prove to you that I can do better than he or her. And if I cannot, then I will want you to vote for the person that you feel is the best choice for you after you've been shown what we plan to do and what has been done and what has not been done. So people who can volunteer to send out flyers, to send out text messages, make phone calls. That's really what matters. Money is very important. You have to pay for those flyers. You have to pay for that phone bank, that text bank. And you know, if I get anywhere near Clyburn, if I really show myself to be a threat to his reelection, he's going to flood the airways with a lot of lies about me. Um, you know, that's going to come. He already has his kill file. And when I say kill file, I'm not saying he's playing this to me physically. I'm saying he already has, you know, They've done their opposition research and they're going to probably have like one of my parents or my students didn't like me crying about how I treated their child. You know, he's going to throw those type of lies out there. I already know those things are coming if I really show myself making an impact toward his reelection. But James Clyburn has an advantage because my area has been politically put to sleep. He's been our representative for 31 years. He has really not had a legitimate challenge to his reelection until recently. The, the last Republican candidate ran against him, another black man, Duke Buckner, actually defeated him in some counties that he has historically won. So this is new for James Clyburn. However, my district has been rocked to sleep and it's hard trying to wake them up. 
Trust me, it's hard. And there's an educational gap there where people are just not even civically educated. Some people thought they can vote online. Some people think, say to me, well, there's nothing he can do. Everybody's going to lie. If he can't do anything, then he doesn't need to be getting paid. Okay? He doesn't need to be getting paid. And he can write a bill. Even if the bill, they say, well, the Republicans won't let him do anything. If you are a leader, you do what's right. If you cannot write a bill and get it passed, then you become the biggest advocate of what needs to be done for us. He can do those things and he does not. That's right. And, and one thing I will say, you know, social media can be very powerful, um, especially TikTok at this point in time. There could be a social media campaign started for people actually pressuring Jim Clyburn to debate you. The young young people are good with that kind of stuff. <laughs> they are, they are. But he, I, I don't think he will pay attention. I believe he will ignore it. And may I just say something with James Clyburn? He actually believes in reparations. He, when he first got in office, we have a group of Native Americans here in South Carolina, North Carolina, called the Catawba. His first, one of his first legislative victories was doing a bill for the Catawba Native Americans, and I'm loosely quoting it for them to get special protections, justice, recognition, and rights. I believe that's actual language from the bill for historical wrongs. He was able to get that bill passed. Until this day, he reintroduces it, because I think it has to be renewed every year, and it passes all the time. And the Catawba Native Americans, they get billions of dollars because of a reparations bill that James Clyburn wrote and sponsored. And he re, he re, and he has to sponsor it again every so often, and he does. He will not do any of that at all. You remember the elder here in my area, Hilton Head, South Carolina? I forgot mm -hmm. her name is Mrs. Wright, Ms. Josephine Wright. She died, unfortunately. Now, mm -hmm. Hilton Head Island is not in James Clyburn's district, but he is a federal representative. He was silent on that. Black land loss is at a crisis. We've lost 90% of our land. 90% of our land has been stolen. He has not written one bill about protecting us in our land, about getting us compensation for our stolen land. He can do it. And even if he put the bill forward and it failed, he can become the biggest advocate for us getting justice for our land. And he will not do it. No, he won't. There was also uh, a gentleman that approached him. I think I saw this on Professor, yeah. no, 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 uh, Black Authority Channel that approached him at the fish fry. Um, and he asked him, like, you know, can we get you to like, co-sign, like push something for reparations? And they were very polite and nice to him. And his response was, why y'all keep fucking with me? That's yeah. how he talks to us. That's how he talks to us. He will never talk to a white person here inside one of the white liberals. He will never talk <laughs> to them that way. And I know people hate the term, some people hate the term illegal immigrant because they say no human being is illegal. When I use that term, I'm not calling the individual illegal. I'm referring to their status, their political status. But in any case, I, there was a town hall, and this was before people, before I had any traction. I confronted James Clyburn at a town hall, and people said that I left him speechless. He had no response for me about his failure towards us, the black Americans in his district. However, there was a woman there. She was an American. She was from Puerto Rico in American territory. And she asked him about the dreamers. His face just lit up. He has nothing but disdain for us black Americans when we come to him for our needs. There was another gentleman. I don't know if he wants me to give his name, so I will not. But he's one of my supporters. He went to James Clyburn's at the South Carolina Democratic Convention in 2023 and asked my reparations and he asked james clyburn do you support him do you support him james clyburn said hell no it'll never happen but this is a man who grew up underneath jim crow where black americans were told that jim crow would never go away we will never have equal rights and when we were told hell no we said let huh, just watch me and Jim Crow fell, on paper at least. During the days of slavery, Black Americans were told it would never happen. Slavery would never go away, and it went away. He is going to be on the side of history of telling us, again, that something we deserve that should happen will not happen. And my response to him is, watch me. That's right. I mean, also, I think I I don't I just feel like a lot of people like James Clyburn, when I look at uh, politicians like him, they're just they're so just outdated. Like it, 
I mean, it's just retire already and <laughs> let in some some new like energy come into Congress. I mean, it's just like I feel like people like him are holding us back from any type of progress uh, in this country. And some of these people just need to retire. I think he needs to retire. I think Nancy Pelosi needs to retire. Like, look, Diane Feinstein, what they this woman died in Congress. Like this, it was obvious she was already sick. She wasn't apparently aware of what was going on around her. They were telling her how to vote. And it's like, they just sit there and hold up seats to protect the status quo, in my opinion. And my, I, my thing is, I don't think we're tired enough. And I'm not trying to shift the blame from them to us. James Clyburn has failed us, absolutely. But there has to be some responsibility on us as well. And I'm not even saying, come on and vote, come on and vote. We treat voting like that's the only at the sphere of power and influence we have. We can run for office as well. The first thing that Black Americans did after the fall of slavery was run for office. James Clyburn knows this because he's a history buff and he knows this is true. South Carolina is a special state. It's the only state in America to ever have a majority black state legislator. It was the first state in America to send a black person to U.S. Congress, Joseph Rainey, right there in Georgetown. If our people can do that in the 1800s, and don't get me wrong, there is still a lot of anti-Black American hate out there. But compared to what we were experiencing in the 1800s, it's a lot easier now. If our ancestors in the 1800s could run for office, some of them were functionally illiterate. Joseph Reed didn't speak English. He spoke Gullah, which is still a language that's spoken here in South Carolina along the coast. If they could run for office then and win and stand up, for their constituents and call out those evil, wicked, white supremacist bigots that they were dealing with at that time, we can do it now. So, Sabrina, I don't feel we're tired enough. Diane Feinstein, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, all of them, um, you know, and on the right, you have Mitch McConnell. They only exist politically speaking because we have allowed them to do so. If we really want them to be replaced, I see that people stop complaining about them and replace them. That's a good point. What about hitting the streets? Because I'm always telling people we need to hit the streets. <laughs> I'm always telling them we need to hit the streets. We need to, you know, organize within. I mean, I organize locally, but I'm like, if you guys are, are you angry enough yet? I'm like, what else needs to happen for people to come out into the streets? And I'm talking, we need what, 5%. 5% of the population to get out into the streets over all the stuff that's happening, whether it's economic issues, some people are mad uh, in reference to the, the minimum wage or not having a living wage, the healthcare issue, just the way the country is treating all of us in general. People can't afford groceries right now. The grocery prices are continuing to increase. Like what else is it gonna take for people to just say, that's it, I've had enough, and for everybody to get out into the streets? Or do you think we're not ready for that? I mean, we're not, because if we were, we would be doing it. I think <laughs> what has to happen, if you are upset and you are angry with your current representative, and by the way, I saw some fools in the comments saying, oh, the replacement theory. Well, guess what? If you have a politician who's supposed to be representing you and they're not representing the needs of your people adequately, I don't care if they're white. I don't care if they're black. I don't care what color, what ethnicity they may have. If they're not representing you adequately and you go to that ballot and none of them deserve your vote, then you stand up and you become the person that's deserving of your vote. And there are more people in this country than there are um, seats. OK, political seats. So you run for office and the people who believe in you, like you said, get organized, go out in the streets and get those votes for you. That's exactly what we need. And if the level of discontent, Congress approval rate, uh, rating goes between eight to 15 percent. As low as congressional approval rate is right now, I say there's definitely an appetite for us to have new people in Congress, but not just new people, better people, the best people. And I may not be one of those people. I believe I am, but I want to be one of the people who practices what they preach. So I believe not, don't sit back and just complain about them, stand up, run for office and replace them. Well said, Marcel. How can people support your campaign? 
Well, one, they can donate. And that is Marcel for Congress. I have it on my shirt here because Marcel spelled a lot of different ways. Marcel for Congress slash donate. If they want to sign up to send out flyers, that's a very, very effective way to help people. I was in Walmart the other day and I saw one of my former colleagues. She's like, hey, I got one of your little fly thingies. I was like, what, really? And then I was in another place and they said, hey, I got one of your little flyers in the mail. So that is really effective, and people are actually recognizing me. It's a little unnerving sometimes, but people actually recognize me out in the streets and say, hey, I think I got a flyer from you with your face on it. So sign up to send out flyers, and you can do that by emailing me at info at marcelforcongress.com. That's the easiest way to do it because the link to sign up to do it, it'll be too long to put in the chat. You can sign up to make phone calls or send out text messages. Awesome. Marcel, thank you so much for coming on. And again, I would love to see you debate Coleman Hughes. <laughs> I would love to have it as well. And I'm going to tell you right now, it will never happen because they like to go on shows. And I'm not insulting Mark Lamar Hill. Mark Lamar Hill, for what I heard, held his own. And I'm sure he did. But typically speaking, they like to go on shows where they feel the person is not going to be adequately quit or not have the background to adequately challenge them. So I doubt it will happen, but I have made the challenge if he really wants to have that debate about reparations. So, Sabrina, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Marcel. You take care. Bye. All right, Marcel. Yeah, I'm telling you guys, I really think, like, come on. Don't you guys think that he could actually beat, if everybody heard Marcel out there speaking, don't you think that he could actually beat Jim Clyburn? So you can go to uh, marcelforcongress.com. Again, he's not running as a Democrat. He's running as a third party candidate, which is what we really root for over on this show. But yeah, something needs to change, right? Something needs to change. Let's go to a couple comments here and then we'll go into the other stories. Thank you for the super chat. Oh, no. Love you, Sabby. Thank you for dedicating your time and efforts to bring us real journalism. Oh, thank you. Although one of the stories tonight might not be real journalism. <laughs> I don't know if the Beyonce one is real <laughs> journalism, but uh, what's up, Pastor Wheeler says, run for mayor or governor of Massachusetts. Our suck. Yes, they do. They do. Shout out to the Oracle says, run, Greg, Marcel, run. Uh, thank you, Roger. Yes, we don't support Dem slash GOP Marcel third or Indy only. Uh, Robert says, Sabby, please introduce him to more media. Clyburn can be beat. I believe he can be beat too, especially since like his turnout is so low, right? Uh, Alma says, the Tulsa race riot survivors, excuse me, survivors, survivors still haven't gotten reparations. They want us all to die out. Interesting. No, but it's true. Uh, thank you, 4411825. Uh, that number is tripping me out. A Latino who, who's of African descent also came here by way of global system of oppression. Thank you for that. Thank you for the super chat, Roger. 2K a week adjusted for inflation for next 250 years land back. Thank you for this as well, Roger. Grants to start our own worker co-ops tax free. Thank you, CM. Free Palestine, free Puerto Rico. We can also add free Hawaii in there too. Thank you for the super sticker, James. Thank you, David. Fry Clyburn, vote Marcel. <laughs> Fish fry Clyburn. Uh, thank you, Troy. Cheers to independent candidates. Break the chains. Agreed. Shout out to Rebecca O'Neill for becoming a savvy member. And also shout out to CM for becoming a savvy member. Let's give them a big whoop whoop. 